I was diagnosed in 2009 with generalized anxiety disorder and depression. I couldn't remember the last time I felt good. I'm successful, I'm capable, I'm out you know, living my life just like anybody else, and this is something that I struggle with. One in four adults in America struggled with a mental illness or with an addiction-related diagnosis within the last year, and people, I don't think, realize how pervasive it is. There's absolutely stigma, and there's a reason that people are afraid to come out and talk about these kinds of things. Being able to go to therapy appointments when I needed to without having to feel like I needed to lie about where I was going or kind of keep it a secret and just be able to openly do what I needed to do um, was extraordinarily helpful. What we're trying to do actually as the future of you lead is to start to get involved more with corporations and corporate America. Mental health is physical health. Your brain's not independent of your body. Uh, you need to really treat it as such and there's a lot of true science behind why people deal with mental health and the chemical reaction in your brain and how that that can alter and affect what uh, you're experiencing, even though you can't see physically on the surface what those signs are. I was genetically destined to have a mental health crisis. My brain does not uh, produce adequate amounts of serotonin. I had just started uh, interning at the Washington Post, and one of my assignments there was to write about a man who had drowned in the Potomac River. And while I was working on this story, all I could think about was drowning myself in the Potomac River. The Love You Project has a great initiative that we partnered with Johns Hopkins to address workplace mental health as a whole. And that's really engaging, you know, the executives of the organization, the HR groups, and that's incredibly important and critical to actually get that management embrace to embrace the the conversation to understand that it's not a scary thing all the time to, to have someone that's dealing with mental health in fact quite common just because it's the brain it doesn't mean that i'm any less worthy of respect in society when there is a threat of suicide friends and family members are more most likely to a ridicule the person, B, encourage them to seek help, C, offer compassion and support, or D, have no response. I've been in environments where there was another employee who had to take some time off for mental health reasons and people talked about it behind his back. They were not kind about it. And for somebody like me, that does not make me feel like I'm ready to open up and that doesn't make me feel like I'm going to be respected and taken seriously if people know certain things about my history. What happens in the workplace, it transcends to the home. If you can affect uh, someone in the way they're being addressed or the way they're dealing with matters in the workplace, when they go home at night, at dinner and after, they're gonna be better off for that. It is important for people to know what their rights are. Um, you know, a lot of mental health diagnoses fall under the Americans with Disabilities Act. You're entitled to um, certain reasonable accommodations from your employer. And if that's something that you need and something that can be helpful, um, you know, ask. I will be able to work as much as I want to, um, which is extremely empowering and, you know, something that I thought might never happen for me. We really think that embracing the young professionals, because they're the ones that will be making those choices, they're gonna be the wave coming up. The older generations are gonna be the ones retiring, and we understand that's, that's the long game, but we know that that's coming. We know that there's that momentum that we're building as a generation.